Welcome um, to this session about the global impact of a tech cold war. My name is Carsten Knob. I'm the editor in chief of digital products of Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which is quite a tongue breaker um, for non German native speakers, but um, it's one of the leading um, German nationwide dailies and, of course, with a huge digital presence on the internet. And to um, more than a few um, extents, I'm really passionate about this topic since um, I'm using um, almost only American technology in our newsroom and um, FATSnet, our website, is hosted on the Microsoft Azure cloud and um, well, basically everything is from the US. So it's uh, possible that you don't feel comfortable with that and um, so I really have um, some good understanding for European politicians who would like to change it and who think about, well, doing something about the dominance of um, US and maybe um, now even Chinese uh, IT companies. And, well, I'm happy to be um, able to present this esteemed panel here. And let me just briefly introduce the panelists. Um, and this session is a little bit special since it's not just only a discussion between the four of us. Um, there will be a short presentation to give you some facts and figures and theses that lead into the topic. And then we'll discuss here just a little bit and then even more with you guys um, in the audience. Thanks for joining us and thanks for being here. Um, Michelle Zetlin, co-founder and chief operating officer of Cloudfare, a company from the United States. Um, from San Francisco, actually, but you're a Canadian-born yes. um, U.S. UB. Entrepreneur. <laughs> Entrepreneur. Yes. And um, Cloudflare is a company that helps its clients to enhance the performance of a website and the security of a website, if you will. Um, presence in, in Europe and other places of the world and uh, a um, listed company for two years now or a year? Some, Actually, so like we're that. about 10 years old and we just went public in September. So right. four months so last ago. Year. So it was a very, starting a company to going public is kind of what every country wants to see for their t local tech entrepreneurs. So Thanks for being here, Michelle. Thanks then Samir Saran, President, um, Observer Research Foundation. That's an independent think tank from India. Hi, Samir, and thanks for stepping in on a really short notice. Since uh, until um, yesterday evening, late in the evening, we expected uh, a minister from Rwanda being here. So, um, so Indian engineers generally step in at short notice. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. And last but not least, John Shipman, Director General and Chief Executive of um, the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, he is from the UK, but you are still welcome here. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, uh, you are basically an expert on this topic, and um, it's a good choice that you will um, give a short presentation into it. So, um, John, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, the IISS is international, so everybody is welcome at the IISS. Um, technology is largely multinational, uh, it creates strengths and it generates vulnerabilities. It is an area of competition and it requires cooperation. Isolation is rarely feasible and integration will often carry risks. So managing the bonds that technology and the attendant supply chains create is an obvious necessity. And this maxim carries particularly relevance to the development of the internet and the competitive environment of the cyber domain, which is what I was originally asked to speak about. Um, the internet has been built and governed uniquely with a fine balance being struck between the interests of the sort of innovative tech coders, uh, companies and governments. Uh, cyberspace became an important domain for the conduct of espionage and also for organized crime and the threat, uh, theft of intellectual property. And an important origin of the present US-China trade and political tension is the increased and proven efforts of China to turbocharge its own industrial and economic development through commercial espionage. 
Uh, though in 2015 a US-China agreement was arrived at uh, on this issue, it really hasn't been very uh, effective. Um, since at least 1999, the US and other states also realized they could use their new cyber capabilities to do more than spy. They could interfere with the code and data of others rather than just grab it, and could covertly insert their own. And we saw the birth of cyber operations, including not just the insertion of malicious code or hacking. These operations were designed to achieve effect, to influence, disrupt, destroy, and states like Iran and North Korea also realized that these capacities give them reach and effect far beyond their borders, including to strike at the heart of the digitally dependent United States. And the list of state-on-state -state operations is very large. They include operations by the US and Iran against each other, Israel and Iran against each other, the Russians against Estonia, Georgia, Ukraine, Russia against at least the US democratic process, and the subsequent US retaliation against the St. Petersburg uh, group that had been deemed to be partly uh, responsible. Iran has done cyber operations against Saudi Arabia and North Korea against Sony Pictures, global banking system, etc. Problem is that the states who operate these cyber offensive operations can lose control of those operations to the detriment of third parties, as was the case with the Maersk uh, shipping line and in the UK with our National Health Service. Cyber operations have also been increasingly aimed now at critical national infrastructures, financial institutions, oil and gas companies, power grids, plants, transport sectors, core communication infrastructures. But the media reports only tell some of the story because now the operations to reconnoiter and gain a presence on relevant networks are occurring every second and are now a permanent feature of cyberspace. So the risk of miscalculation is high, critical national infrastructure networks are complicated, an opponent needs first to insert their code, later to activate it, remaining in contact with the code to ensure that it can still function. But that kind of pre-positioning of a cyber munition could be misinterpreted as an attack by the defender, cause a retaliation, or the code could malfunction, create an, uh, an accident, escalation could follow. So in these circumstances, China has learned the advantages that it thinks it could gain with greater influence over the physical development of cyberspace beyond just the advantage to its own internal uh, security. The combination of its Made in China 2025 strategy with a digital uh, component of the Belt and Road Initiative could see much of the developing world turning to China for help in building fiber optic cables, mobile networks, satellite relay stations, data centers, servers, e-government platforms, and smart cities. And President Xi has prioritized uh, China's indigenous microchip and quantum computing and AI uh, 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 capabilities as central uh, to this effort. And at the front line of this is Huawei. Uh, the US position on Huawei is clear. In May 2019, the Department of Commerce added Huawei to its entities list. And the US position is that the presence of Chinese equipment in a country's 5G network, given the technical differences between 5G and previous generations, greatly increases the risk of espionage and sabotage. And this is all the more the case because of a Chinese law that would require any company to provide intelligence to the state if asked. And the U.S. clearly sees that protecting the U.S. ICT advantage is the core goal of its international tech diplomacy. A few countries agree with the U.S., many do not, and some remain undecided. In the U.K., the view of the technical experts is that the 5G risk can be managed much as the 4G risk has been. Additionally, were Huawei to be allowed into the system, they would be excluded from the so-called core. It's estimated, for example, that Vodafone has three main data centers for 4G in the UK. It would only have three more with 5G, suggesting that at least this core capability could be managed. As for the delicate intelligence links that the UK enjoys, the member of the Five Eyes, uh, some people think that these might be politically put at risk, but the fact remains that intelligence sharing does not happen over public networks. It's heavily encrypted, uh, and it doesn't exactly happen over WhatsApp or over Signal. Uh, so the idea that the UK having uh, other uh, suppliers into its 5G network would remotely touch the technical manner with which the US and the UK exchange intelligence is just not correct. Um, 
But the wider point is that the US and China are grappling for who will dominate the future of, of cyberspace. Uh, and ICT development covers microchips, computer assembly, internet essential services. US and European and other uh, states have 42 of the top 50 companies, with China having eight of the top 50 chi companies. But Chinese companies are now rapidly expanding their market share in East and Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa as part of the Digital Silk Road program. And the data that China will gain from those investments and cooperation will help to fuel China's digital ambitions. Remember one basic fact. At present, the enormous amount of data that China gets from its own 1.4 billion population is actually fairly homogeneous. The more diverse data it collects from other geographies is what will empower it as a data superpower. Now, for its part, China has contested the way the internet is governed, Push, wants to push for greater state control. It seeks support from parts of the developing world to establish norms and, you, and protocols in that spirit. The US is interested in protecting its global ICT advantage. Russia appears to be trying to develop some form of national intranet. And so with these three powers having different visions, the fear has grown that a global internet will break down into three or more separate ecosystems. The ecosystem issue is important. What do we want the future to be? The choice may be between the continuation of this multi-stakeholder free model that we have today, or one with greater state control or some compromised position. The continuation of a single internet would see all countries, including China, having a vested interest in the global economy that it supports. A bifurcation of the internet, sometimes called the splinter net, could see two competing uh, models. We would have separate supply chains and ICT built to different standards, each looking to win business from each other, but with the Chinese model potentially being much more attractive uh, to the developing world that prioritizes internal security. Clearly, the banning of Chinese tech in the US and allied networks heightens the risk of uh, a, a splinter net. It's already happening in the military domain where you saw last week uh, the U.S. asked the Taiwanese company TSMC that also supplies Huawei uh, to produce its military chips in the U.S. because those are the military chips that go into the F-35 fighter jet. By the way, the F-35 fighter jet is basically also the J-20 in China because China was able to steal from Lockheed Martin in a cyber operation all the designs of the F-35. So there's also an F-35 produced in China, but it is called the J-20. A balkanized network, though, would be problematic for consumers and maybe even more dangerous. It could mean that more state-on-state -state cyber operations are uh, conducted. There are lots of national security risks that could also arise uh, from a lack of diversity in the high-tech uh, marketplace. Uh, and a number of countries are trying to ad adapt. We think of uh, Japan that has introduced tax breaks to national firms investing in 5G as an example in an effort to create a form of national champion. And finally, the need to develop international norms for cyberspace will, I think, uh, only intensify. So that means we need to look to standards a little bit more. Countries and companies will need universal standards for ICT products to ensure the reliability of the tech they employ and the welfare of their citizens using it, as well as to ensure the ability to sell into foreign markets. That is why Huawei, Qualcomm, and others have put such efforts into filing 5G patents. But there are few patents from anyone relating to security. Had the international community spent much more time designing international standards to control the cybersecurity risk from espionage or sabotage, I think the current debate around 5G would now be very different, and Huawei's tender price would have been much higher, leveling the playing field with Nokia and Ericsson. US companies in the 1990s were actually quite effective in opening an office in Beijing to lobby on standards in China to make representations to Beijing this day. Uh, Microsoft and Cisco were invited three years ago into China's new cybersecurity council. So US companies have been able to try to insert some of their own standards into the Chinese marketplace. IBM and the Bank of China as recently as September 2019 agreed to expand their existing relationship to create a new innovation model uh, for the financial uh, industry. And that's an example of how entangled US and Chinese entities actually are in cyberspace, together, of course, supporting tens of trillions of dollars of exchanges uh, per year. So in my judgment, now is the time to begin working together, having failed to do so for 5G, using well-practiced standard setting arrangements to design 
the universal standards for the generations of mobile technology that will follow 5G and to design those also for AI. And the broader goal would be to establish the ICT standards that would ensure the single interoperable internet on which the global economy depends. There will still be security challenges, COVID interference. National origins of technology don't necessarily affect this. The US and Israel interfered with Siemens equipment when it covertly launched cyber attacks on Iranian centrifuges. Stakeholders, it Davos, so I'll conclude with stakeholders, 90 seconds more. The future of the internet isn't just a techie subject to be left to the techie experts. It is germane to future global power and no nation, company, international institution or other stakeholder can leave it to others. And it certainly shouldn't be left to the US and China alone. The development of norms and the development of standards should be reinforcing, and that's something which will require international and national interventions on ICT from companies and governments. And there'll be a need to engage with international standards bodies, like the UN Group of Government Experts and the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. Conversations between governments and companies need to be based on rigorous research rather than being narrowly shaped, the national investment model for ICT needs more robustly to be considered. Is, for example, the Japan model to build a national capability, one that others might wish to develop? So in conclusion, if anything were a typical Davos multi-stakeholder subject containing competition in a technological cold war, especially in cyberspace, qualifies. Thank you very much. John, thank you. And um, just a question for the audience, and it's for all of you, and you can raise your hand. Who heard the term splinternet before? Maybe half, no, but not even half, I guess. So um, this is a fairly new development, and it's, uh, the, the sad thing is it's actually happening. <laughs> Um, Michelle, um, you run a company that's, uh, that relies on, on, on clients from all over the world. Um, do you feel this, this separation of, of the network already while talking to your clients? Um, I thought your remarks were really helpful to help set the context. And I would just add one, one, one nuanced sort of thing to help answer this yeah. question. So 10 years ago, there were eight technology companies that had market caps that were over $100 billion, only eight 10 years ago. And so because there was only eight, I think a lot of people thought, oh, those technology companies, they're the geeks in the corner, counterculture, they're not that interesting, not that important. Today, there are 25 technology companies who have market caps over $100 billion. There are I'm four from Europe. Well, yet. Um, uh, hopefully there's an entrepreneur here who helps change that. There are four of those Four of those 25 companies, well, there are four companies in the world that have market caps over a trillion dollars. All four are technology companies. And there's a whole host that are behind. And so this is why this is such a <coughs> forefront, where before it kind of went from this technology, went from this thing in the corner to something that's really shaping industries and economies, both at the domestic level and national. And it's not going away. It's only going to accelerate because of all the things you <coughs> outlined. And, and so oh, it's not a surprise that it's at a forefront, because all of a sudden it's like, wait, these are big economic upswings. Who's going to capture that value? Uh, as an entrepreneur who's built a large global company uh, that happened to start in the United States, I absolutely believe in a free and open internet. We want interoperability between countries and the internet. We want the internet to transcend country borders. We think that's very important. We think that helps drive innovation, which helps make it better for citizens and the businesses in those countries. And while there are absolutely ch challenges that come with all of the upside, no doubt the internet has made our lives better, not worse. Um, you know, whether it's business productivity, the way we communicate, how you order food or a phone. I mean, there's so many examples where it's it's been a force for good, but with the good, there have been challenges. Um, in terms of this splinternet idea, I think the one narrative that sometimes gets lost, or people say it, but it gets forgotten, and I cannot, it's kind of counterintuitive, but I'm gonna say it here because it's so important. If countries go to more of the splinternet, where you have the Chinese with their internet model, the US, and then India potentially with their model, and potentially a fourth, the companies that are best served by that are actually the biggest companies because they have the resources to be able to figure out how to solve that from a technical 
perspective or how to work with the policymakers to figure that out. And the people that it harms are actually the entrepreneurs and the new entrants trying to create something in that market. And so I absolutely believe in interoperability of free and open internet, so I will look for policies that do that, while understanding how can each country domestically have strong, robust domestic tech industries as well. And if we go to more of a splinter net, then I actually think it, it the favors the internet giants, the exact thing that c countries are trying to get away from. Right. So, um, but of course, I guess there are a lot of advocates of free trade here in, in Davos, always have been. But um, to be realistic, free trade is not a really popular topic. And listening to the president from the United States, you, you get an even deeper impression. On, on that one. So um, why should we be optimistic about the free flow of data in, in the future? Right. Well, I mean, I, there, are, there, are, there have been some bad behaviors that have gone on and um, from both the technology companies and the, and, the, and the governments. And we should have conversations about saying, what do we want this to look like in the future? And I think that the companies that will win in the future are ones that build great technology that solve, that deliver real value to their customers. Um, and show, demonstrate responsible leadership about these tricky situations. Because as technology becomes more and more important, what happens is it comes closer and closer to policy. And the next 10 years is all about policy in technology. And so if you are a policymaker, you need to learn a lot about the technology. And if you're a technologist, you need to learn a lot about the policy side. And right now, we kind of have begin beginners and amateurs in both fields. And so it's the, it's the companies and the policymakers who lean in and say, OK, explain to me how the technology works. And then the technologists say to the policymakers, what are you trying to protect against? And trying to have that conversation, if we can do that, we will have much better outcomes over the next 10 years. And again, and I think there are lots of places where that's happening and it needs to happen more. And I think that's what uh, a conference like Davos can help convene those conversations between the policymakers, the governments, and the technologists to say, hey, how are we gonna solve some of the challenges that come up? Because while there have been some bad behaviors in the past, it doesn't mean that it has to continue in the future. And I think the leaders who say, hey, we're gonna do something about it are the ones that will demonstrate, um, will create the most uh, positive change. Um, uh, Samir, one question for you before we open it to um, the audience also. Um, there was one thesis, if you will, in, in John's opening remarks mm -hmm. that um, the Chinese form of um, the internet, a controlled one, may be the most attractive one for developing countries. Um, do you think that's right? I mean, the answer is yes. That may be right, uh, but I genuinely believe that uh, it is also the price points, which is beyond just the control. It's also the affordability and the accessibility that uh, strengthens the Chinese proposition. Let me give you a very recent example. We had, uh, as a country a few years ago, I think this was during the time when many of us still used the BlackBerry. The, mm -hmm. You know, there used to be the a Canadian company. The Canadian company, that's right. <laughs> Some guys will remember. Yeah. And uh, at that particular point of time, um, there was this big hula baloo in India about uh, Indian data being stored on Canadian servers because of the messenger service that BBM used to, the, the BlackBerry used to offer. And uh, uh, a, a Chinese company at that point of time had just begun starting introducing phones which were offering similar services. Now, the rule that came out at that point of time from India was that anyone who wants to offer this service should keep their servers in India. BlackBerry refused, the Chinese agreed. More recently, we have asked in terms of our 5G trials that there are certain uh, transparency mechanisms that need to be adhered to if you want to operate a network in India. Western companies say no. The Chinese say, please, use our, we will open everything up for you. We will dismantle it all. We will give you everything you want. Use the Chinese equipment. So I think it's more than just the control element. I think, yes, uh, m many parts of the emerging world uh, and in fact, forget about the emerging world, I think many parts of Europe and uh, perhaps even the US today uh, would like the state to be more in charge. And, and the idea that a strong state is important is not an emerging world phenomenon. It is not a developing country reality. It is a secular phenomenon happening around the world. 
the populist and strongman leaders were born out of the uh, Western Hemisphere, and we are only catching up. But 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 I think um, uh, uh, so so it is not a developing country. I think many political regimes around the world will will like the Chinese offer for multiple reasons. That's the, but let me just respond to something that. Um, John, and John, it was a fantastic presentation. I think it, 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 you kind of captured a very long story in a very succinct manner. Uh, but let me just put two, let me problematize it. I don't think we are looking at the balkanization. I think the internet was always balkanized. Mm -hmm. There were three reasons why the internet was always divided. For someone living in India, I could never access much of the content because A, I could not afford it. Mm -hmm. So intellectual property was as chilling as freedom of expression counter freedom of special laws in other countries. When you have strong IPR laws and there are people who have committed suicide, you are denied access to information for which the internet was created. That was one reason why there was the differential internet. Those who had money accessed a certain form of internet. Those who did not, did not access certain parts of it. There were the dark wave for people who could not afford it. The second, I think the Great Firewall of China was always uh, designed to be uh, uh, the reason for the world, uh, the world Wide Web to be divided. They opened the doors and windows on their terms. The internet was balkanized and it was sometimes connected when the Chinese decided that the terms of engagement were all right for them. I think what is happening now is a pushback. And I think amongst many problems that many people may have with Donald Trump, I think one thing he has got right is his approach to the Chinese. I think one of the few things he's doing right is, is, is resetting the trade and tech terms with the Chinese. And I think he is for the first time telling them that you're not getting a free pass. You can't dip into our internet. And, and engage with us on your terms. We need to have a reciprocity uh, uh, on technology terms. And I think he may not stay the course because like everything else that he does, I think it, uh, a little bit of stamina and focus is important to make this happen. But he's probably got the discourse right. I don't know whether he's got his intent right. So I think that's the second thing. And finally, I think um, uh, we also need to understand that um, in, uh, today, like you rightly mentioned, uh, tech and technology flows represent actually trade flows and financial flows. If you look at the World Economic Forum chart from a few years ago, and I can't remember exactly the year of production, but you would find a stagnation in the flow of uh, new finance and in the flow of new goods. But you would see an exponential rise in the flow of data, which really means that uh, the global value flows are, are now moving through data. Now, so in some sense, data flows represent the future of trade, globalization 4.0, the sharing of value, etc. And if you look at that, I think you have to understand that what we are really talking about is a whole new architecture. So this Cold War is not about tech Cold War. The Cold War is about two differential trading systems. We are actually hitting at the global trading arrangement when we are discussing technology today. We are talking about global political arrangements when we are discussing technology today. This is not a tech Cold War. This is a full-blown Cold War. We will have two spheres of influence or three spheres of influence we will have similarly three differential political regimes that will be operating at the same point of time. We will have three security arrangements which are different, or, and the number three is arbitrary. Right. Uh, you can multiply it's it. More, right? It's, uh, yeah. It's more already. Uh, uh, correct. Yeah. So, so what I'm really trying to say is that don't limit it to a tech cold war. This is a full-blown Cold War. Tech represents everything. Your political stability can be implicated by tech. Your trade is all about tech. Your security is about tech. Your, solution, your social organizations, your auto autonomous vehicles, your ride-sharing, how you love, how you romance, how you date, everything is tech. So, so, the, so the, when you're really talking about the, uh, 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 the cold edge where countries are now finding disagreement, you're really talking about a full-blown Cold War. It's beyond tech. Okay. So I would be really surprised if there weren't any questions from questions from the audience on those topics. So who would love to have the first shot? <laughs> <laughs> so who's going to win this war was the question. Well, well, I have a point of view. It's not about winning the war, but um, I... I actually think it's an opportunity for India, and if India doesn't step up, potentially another large uh, country to step up. So I don't, I, there's the China model, of which the way the internet works, and then there's, there's the US model, where China has this state-owned data layer and that creates a lot of value, accrues a lot of value domestically, whereas the US has this very unregulated data layer that they say opens up to private industry to compete on. And I don't think, the world, I think there are a lot of people in the world that don't want to adopt neither the China model nor the US model. And so the question is, whose model do they adopt? And so one of the things I said to Samir before is, 
I actually think India has the opportunity to step up and play that role. And then he said, well, I hope that doesn't happen because there's a lot of bad things happening, or there's a lot of things going in the wrong direction right now. But, but I do think there, there may be a third model and that there's an appetite from a lot of countries around the world to say, hey, we don't like the US model, we don't like the China model, we want a third model, and there's an opportunity for someone to present that, and then for actually all, much of the world to migrate to that. So I actually think there's an opportunity for someone to step up. I maybe thought it was gonna be India. Maybe Europe? Maybe Europe. Europe could be. Europe is another, 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 another region of the world that is really taking a stance here. So it could be. I heard someone from the audience say, "Of course, Europe." So Europe or India. I think those are two potential opportunities where people, where other countries around the world, can say, "Huh, let's do it this way." Okay. You know, my response to that particular question would be that I don't know who wins or who should be winning, but I, if we can, let me uh, pull a phrase out of the Russian dictionary and uh, suggest that if we can convert the Cold War into hot peace, we might be better served. And I think that's something that uh, John mentioned in his uh, initial presentation, that if we can agree to a, a, a framework of standards, you know, so, something we did with the telecommunication uh, networks around the world, that you, know, you, you sanctioned each other, you fought wars with each other, but you could still connect to each other online. You, know, you could still dial the number and get through. So I think if we can come to a robust standards framework, that keeps the interoperability, and let's, let's uh, define it in two levels. One is the bare minimum required to keep it healthy, and other is the lifestyle where we can do plenty more. If we can do the bare minimum to, uh, to keep the net alive and maintain that hot piece that even as we differ on technologies and Huawei's and your way and my way, we can uh, still uh, continue to transact, uh, engage, communicate, and, and, uh, and, and collaborate. Now, that's one part of it. The second is that uh, it is... There were two theories uh, to thrown at us at the turn of the century. One, of course, was by uh, very eminent thinkers like Joseph Nye and others, who argued for the longest while, or who suggested for some time in their works that uh, the Chinese would never be able to compete with Western technology simply because they don't have democracy and freedom of expression right. and innovation. Not creative enough. Correct, like that. not creative mm. enough. Now, I think the Chinese have clearly disproved that theorem. See, that particular school of thought will have to now come up with a new idea to, to respond to what the Chinese have really been able to do. Now, whether it is theft, but guess what? Let's start, th let's start talking about who stole textile technologies a few hundred years ago and who stole some other. You know, let's, let, let's, and you'll suddenly realize that we are very close to home right now of, of, of the den of thieves who, who created the second and third industrial revolution. So I don't think IPR theft is anything unique to the Chinese. What they have really stunned the world with is that, and by the way, I, I'm not lauding them or applauding them. I'm just a neighbor who shares a 4,000 kilometer border, which they don't agree to. Mm. So, uh, 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 but, but, but uh, let me just tell you that, that they have been able to create a potent Chinese alternative. And I'm not saying, not so sure that they're going to win uh, in, in this, in this long, longer race, but certainly they are a compelling actor you cannot ignore. And if you think you can normalize Chinese businesses into, say, a UK industry model or a European, I think you are being a little naive. It's time for everyone who engages with China to be far more strategic. They are not innocent businessmen anymore. They have proven to the world that they are compelling strategic actors and technology is the most powerful weapon they have today. So I think we need to drop the naivety and the romance around the rise of China or the rise of any other actor with that kind of capabilities. That's the point. Well, and, and as the technology, co well, as a company, who's, if you're trying to build a global company, you have to abide by the laws of the rules in which you operate in. And uh, that is really important. And so there have been several US tech companies who tried to say, oh, we're not gonna do it the China way, or we're not gonna do it this way, we're gonna do it our way, and that doesn't work. And so I think that also, it works the other way to what you're saying too, Samir, is if you are a business owner, it is on you to make sure you're following the rule of the law in the countries in which you operate. Right. And, and it's that, that, that is a nuanced point that's very important. Could I just ask you, um, why wasn't your go-to uh, place Europe? And you thought of India first. Yoga? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 be honest. Uh, well, yeah, right, be honest. Well, no, 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 right. I mean, I, you know, there are, there's a large population in India, which is very interesting. Um, so, you know, over, so the size of the region plays an important role because that, creates a large economy that you can buy from inter internally, but then also the global nature. So I think it really comes back to the size. 
And then having said that, I would say that, um, you know, you joked when you read out some of your stats about 50 large companies, 42 of which are US-based, eight which are China-based, and, and yeah. Kirsten made a comment on none are European-based. And I mean, you kind of ask, why haven't there been very many recent internet giants coming out of Europe? There should have been. The last one I can think of is Skype and Spotify would be the last two that I can think of, and there should be more. And from your right from my vantage. To right, right. Well, so what should happen in Europe to to help better? enable yeah. more? Well, okay. So this is different than than what is going on. But as a, if you look at all of the large unicorns, unicorns is defined by a technology company that's raised venture capital that's worth more than a billion dollars. Um, a lot of them are based in the United States. Some are private, some are still public because it's venture funding, so you kind of have a sense of the value. But if you look at the ones where who are the founders, over half of those are actually founded by a foreigner. So it's not the Americans who are actually coming up with innovative companies. It's the greatest German founders are actually moving to the U.S. to start the company. Or like me, I'm a Canadian who moved to the U.S. to start a very successful company. And so it's actually not the Americans who are innovating. What they are, they are attracting the innovators from around the world to come there to start what are very ambitious companies. And so then the question is, why do they go there and stay at home? And, and I will say that building a company is very hard. The odds are 100% stacked against you. It's a one in a thousand chance you'll make it. You read every single stat, you think, why does anyone start a company? It's all about failure, failure, failure. Because the ones that succeed, you end up the stories of Steve Jobs or Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg, and people say, I want that. I want to build a company like that. And the best place to do that historically has been the United States. And many of the reasons why is access to capital, access to the people who can you attract to come work to build these companies. It's not one person you need a team to build to make it happen. And it was, it had a, it, it's been working on it for over 50 years. It's an ecosystem that helps enable all of that. Now what you've seen is, I actually think the answer today is very different than 10 years ago. I'm not so sure the Silicon Valley is still the best place to start a company. And if you read anything about tech, there's a lot of backlash against that. It's not as, uh, not as clear cut. There's a lot more capital around the world. Uh, it's it's there. There are a lot of people who have left that part of the world and who are now starting companies in other places. And there are a lot of companies who say, "Hey, I want what the Silicon Valley has created." And the governments are doing really smart things to attract people to stay in their home countries to do it. So we'll see whether it's still the right place. But historically, that was the best, where if you were an entrepreneur trying to build a very global, large company, very ambitious company, your best chance of success in the past was to move to the valley. I don't know if that's the case anymore, and I think it, it, may, and it may be changing. But that's historically why. Again, it's not the Americans innovating. It's America is the place that all the innovators went to realize their dreams. Before I will be taking two more questions, one for John, since you are the other European on this panel, would you like to add something from a European perspective on, on, on that one? Well, all I would say is that um, a bit of it is about competition policy, and so the difficulty is when you have just Nokia and Ericsson, uh, and if you're trying to create a European champion, can that be done within the, the competition regulations that the EU uh, likes? So you'll have one com uh, commissioner that is in charge of digital issues that will say, great, let's have you know a single European champion. Then you'll have a competition commissioner say, no, no, that's against the rules. So there'll need to be some sort of intermediation between, between those two. Uh, the EU has a great administrative brain, so it should have the capacity to set standards in the digital mm -hmm. domain. Uh, it would open up some wounds within Europe because there's a 16 European countries that like to dip their toe into the China. Uh, Chinese um, uh, pot quite a bit. And right. uh, there's a lot of diversity of view in the European Union about just a basic Huawei, Huawei issue, but it should be something on which I think uh, the new uh, president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, who did have a background in defense and understands these issues, uh, might want to lead a, a more strategic debate on. Uh, standards are really important because they also make uh, uh, competition uh, a more level uh, playing field. And when people uh, talk about economic warfare, they think about sanctions. Mm. You, you just impose sanctions. 
but actually a more neutral thing is you impose standards uh, that then some of your competitors who might have unhealthy motivations have difficulty meeting. And I think uh, uh, Western Europeans and North Americans have missed out a bit in thinking about how they, they can influence standard setting in a way that makes the competition a little bit more honest and fair. So actually we didn't even manage to build a true digital single market um, so far, so um, when it comes to standards, right? So we have time for, I guess, two more quick questions and short answers. Yeah. So please. Uh, uh, Huawei showed up uh, in the screen, and, <laughs> and but was not mentioned. Uh, the question is, and to whoever wants to pick it up, but probably to Miss uh, Zetlin uh, especially, um, the fact that the Chinese are willing to use their tech companies as geopolitical tools. Do you think that? Uh, might lead uh, the U.S. to view their companies also as geopolitical tools because of the rivalry. Can I just jump in there yes, first? Yes, please, yeah. please, please. If, you if jump it, in, yeah. maybe if first it, and last. If it's geopolitics, I can't con yes, uh, restrain myself. Oh, yes. um, I think uh, a, a couple of uh, points here. Um, the People's Liberation Army uh, only uses Microsoft operating systems. So I will just leave that point there. Um, on uh, Huawei is specific because uh, there is no question that the Chinese state has an ability to compel its own companies to provide intelligence to it in a way that the United States has signally failed to do. Uh, the ability of the FBI to be able to access an Apple phone in order to figure out the communications of someone you know, who blew up a base uh, is limited. There's a month worth of litigation. You end up having to sort of pay a, a, a clever uh, techie from you know, a country outside of the United States to be able to figure out how to do it. So the United States is uh, not um, positioned to use its ICT companies for geopolitical purposes uh, in the same way that the Chinese are. They can't even compel, as often as they would like, uh, their um, ICT companies uh, to give it information uh, to counter terrorist <laughs> threats uh, or the problems of you know, child pornography or so many other ills that unfortunately uh, pollute uh, the internet. But on the specific issue of, 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 of Huawei, the big concern is that, oh, if uh, uh, the uh, Chinese were through Huawei to build 5G networks, well, then they could easily do denial of service attacks uh, from their own kit. They do denial of service attacks every second of every day. You don't need your own kit to do it. And if you were to use your own kit, and that would be identified, that would be the end of the story. That would kill Huawei globally forever. And so I think that in the UK and in European countries, there's a very sophisticated understanding of the Chinese threat in cyberspace. Um, and um, certainly in the UK, GCHQ has a comparative advantage because uh, we've compelled Huawei to show us their source code. Uh, uh, they actually uh, pay for a place in Banbury in Oxfordshire that has 500 techies in it that looks at Huawei code. It's quite efficient, but it's very buggy. Uh, and then they charge Huawei to fix those bugs. So we gather a fair amount of intelligence <laughs> on Huawei, and that is the condition of their market entry, and it will still be the condition of their market entry. So I think sometimes in the United States, people don't understand some of the advantages of engaging, of, uh, of, of engaging with uh, uh, the Chinese <coughs> if you have the skill set to do it. And what the UK does maybe is not scalable to Romania um, because GCHQ is in the, different the top tier of signals intelligence agencies. But if you have that capacity, then it's useful to use it. So I know that there are other questions, uh, quite a few uh, actually in the audience, but. Um, please accept my apologies. Time is running out. It's only two more minutes, and it's all not not too good if you don't uh, if you aren't able to close the, the panel. So, but I guess there will be a chance to ask our panelists uh, afterwards those particular questions. And I do know that you wanted to add something very briefly before mm -hmm. we conclude everything here. Yeah, when you were uh, sitting in when you were living in India in the 1980s during the Cold War. 
there was a common refrain that America has its most powerful generals called General Motors, General Dynamics, General Atomics, and General Electric. So since when were big companies, transnational companies, not geopolitical? I think they always were. And ask me, because East India Company colonized us. So, so, so companies were always geopolitical instruments, and governments have used them and continue to use them. That's the first point. Second, I think your point is very important. Unless EU reconciles its battle with data, EU is not going to produce innovation at scale. I think it doesn't know how to handle its people's data. In America, the private companies own it. In China, the state owns it. In India, both of them own it. So unless you reconcile your battle with data, you will not produce the next miracle. Okay. And I will just add, just I know, and I'm going to be really brief. You know, I want, I just, I, I agree with everything that's said. But back to your question, the one thing that I wish we would tell more stories of of examples of where US and China have actually, there have been some bright spots, and there have been bright spots. You mentioned Microsoft. Microsoft actually runs a very large business in China, profitably. And it's actually, and, and, and I think the Chinese is happy about it, they're happy about it, I actually think it's worked very well. I'm an entrepreneur, Cloudflare. We've actually been operating in China for the last five years, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing. And so there are actually a lot of bright spots between the US and China, and I, what I would like is in between some of the places where it's not so bright, that the bright spots don't get forgotten. And so I think that's very important. It's, it's an and. So uh, thank you all. Actually, um, I guess Europe uh, will need to get its act together. And I do hope that Thierry Breton, the new commissioner who is in charge of all this, is right when he says that the cards on, in, in, in this tech will always be mixed in you and there will be a new game. We're desperately in need for that if you are right that there is still a war, a war already going on. So thanks for listening. Thanks to our readers on Fatsnet and you in the audience. Um, and thanks for joining us here. <laughs>